the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. On today's show, Ray sits down with Guy East, CEO of Eastway Custom Homes. We live our lives in too much static to not hear God. And so you need to dial it in to what God is telling you. And if I would have done that when I was 20, boy, who knows what I could have accomplished. Hello again, everybody. This is Ray Hilbert, and I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith. And this is the program where we get the incredible opportunity to travel the country and talk with and interview some of the top Christ followers in business and in marketplace leadership. Uh, We talk with CEOs and business owners and high-capacity executives and managers, and occasionally we get the opportunity to talk with top-tier athletic coaches, uh, actors and celebrities and so forth. But what we're all about here at Bottom Line Faith, this is the program where the analogy we like to use is we're going to lift the hood and we are going to tinker around in the engine of Christian leadership. We like to learn how these top capacity leaders think, how they plan, how they fail, how they live out their faith in the marketplace, and how God is using them to fulfill the calling He's placed on their lives. And so, folks, if you are a first-time listener, welcome to the program. You can learn more about Bottom Line Faith. You can listen to the dozens of interviews we have posted at our website at bottomlinefaith.org. That's bottomlinefaith.org. You can also scroll down to the bottom of the page there, and you can subscribe and become a regular listener to the program, whether you use iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, whatever your podcast platform is. You can sign up there at bottomlinefaith.org. Well, let's get rocking and rolling. I am really, really jacked. Russell's our producer here. Russell, I am really jacked about uh, our guest in studio today, and this has <laughs> become one of my dearest friends in life. And I really, I didn't tell him this, but... Um, I just plan this because every time I get a chance to have time with this guy, I'm blessed and I walk away a, a, a better man. And so, yeah, we're going to do an interview, but I'm really being selfish with this one today. Folks, we are welcoming into the studio my friend, and now to be your friend, Guy East. Guy is the CEO of Eastway Custom Homes right in my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana. Guy, welcome to Bottom Line Faith, my brother. Glad to be here, Brother Ray. It's good to be here. Well, you and I have, over the last few years, began to develop, at least I treasure our friendship, and you, every time you and I speak, every time I get time with you, as I just shared, I I feel like I've spent time with someone who helps me grow closer to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You are an encourager, you are a blesser, and you also, in in a very special way, challenge me in my walk, and so uh, that's what I'm expecting that our listeners are going to get today, so no pressure. Mm -hmm. No pressure. I am what I am, so uh, whatever they hear, they get to hear and be blessed, hopefully. That's fantastic. And Guy, we're going to learn more about your company and, and particularly how you really view your business as a ministry and serving the Lord, but get, just give us some background, kind of how you grew up, where you grew up, how you came to cr- uh, faith in Christ. Just give us a snapshot there. Yeah, well, I grew up in Indianapolis, really, after uh, my mother died in Iowa, after my father had uh, graduated from Stanford, and we were at his first job at a university. And so at eight years old, having been born in San Jose and uh, had one stop in Iowa, my mother died unexpectedly in childbirth uh, with my uh, sister, who died as well. And so that really changed the trajectory of of my father's life, which actually affected me and my siblings. So I think what's really important to know right there is that at my mother's funeral, as an eight-year-old boy, I was at her uh, calling, and it was an open cask, and I was, remember looking at my mother, and I was so close to her. I was the first oldest son out of um, four children, and, and I just remember asking her that I thought, Mom, who's going to take care of me? with you gone. And she wasn't listening. Or she wasn't responding, obviously, but I was an eight-year-old kid. And so it was as if the hand of God came down on my shoulder. And as I'm asking this, and actually what I later found out that I had was up there long enough to where the ceremony was delayed, because I was having conversation, what ended up being with God. And it was, uh, God actually wrapped his arms around me and he answered my question. He says, I will be with you. 
Mm. I will take care of you. And so I've had, I really feel like I've always had a super dose of, of faithfulness because after hearing that confidence and be, I mean, being confident of that, of that experience with God was life changing. Now I didn't come to know Christ for 15 years later though. And I went through the rebellious stage and just about three years after I married my childhood sweetheart, uh, we dated for seven years. And then after college graduation, we married. And I think she realized that, uh, boy, I married this pagan here, even though I sat in the front pew of our hmm. uh, Presbyterian church and my father and stepmother were elders of the church and very involved. But I had not heard Jesus in any of the, the sermons, and I was on my own path. But, uh, you know, it was something special. I was working on a, a tall high-rise project downtown Cincinnati, and my wife has said, hey, there's a movie out here by Billy Graham, The Prodigal. Let's go see it. And so that movie, at, at my age 23, I saw that movie, then thought, I think they're talking about me in that movie. So I went back the next night, and I realized that they that God was calling me, and then I confessed my faith right there overlooking Cincinnati that night. So, At age? Eight, I was 23. 23. Yeah. So uh, newly married, re- relatively newly married at that point, right? Yeah, three months. What, what happened then? I mean, just kind of give us... You know, now you're into early adulthood, but how did your faith become just like really real to you? More than just a conversion, but give us examples. Walk us through what the, how that began to shape up for you. So my father was from the greatest generation. Uh, I must say that he was a dean of liberal arts. He was actually the debate coach at the Nixon Kennedy debate when it was held in uh, in San Francisco in the early 60s, and so he was very involved with his university. He loved children as well, and he became very involved in giving back to the Boys and Girls Clubs as well. But um, he wasn't always around, and even though he set up a good model, maybe my willingness was not really always as as he wanted it. So after some rebellious uh, running around and doing what we do at teenage years, we... Um, I realized that my childhood sweetheart married her, was thankful that, that we were married. But it wasn't until, really, I would say the night after 9-11 happened, and I would say what really began to solidify my faith was not in 1983, but actually was that 18 years later in 2001, when a small group that we were with, the leader challenged us to begin walking and praying with our wives and praying for not only our marriage, but praying for our country, because our country was in a time of crisis at that time. And so that began two days really after 9-11, my wife and I began a discipline of prayer walking that took us an average of five miles a day, even on the days we didn't walk. We It was over 1,800 miles a year we seemed to walk. But we would go 70 to 80 minutes, and we would pray for neighbors. We'd pray for the students on the school bus going by and on the bus drivers and administration. And, of course, our family, our children, absolutely, we would pray for our marriage. We'd pray for our family. So it was really became a very uh, very fun discipline. And to the point to where we thought, well, if we don't get up, and some mornings it was very tough because it was cold out. It'd be, you know, we had a rule of like, well, if it gets five degrees, I'm, we're going to, we can take a pass. <laughs> But then we thought, well, who's going to pray for these people if we don't go out and do it? And so that was really our motivation. And so that discipline continued up into uh, just two weeks shy of 15 years. You talk about a launching point. So that was a, that discipline was beautiful. I, I think because of that, we were able to stay married, happily married, and grow in our marriage. And become one, as Genesis 2.24 tells us, is that we are to become one, united in flesh. But that really didn't happen until two weeks shy of 15 years of walking. And that's when my back gave out. And I was at a coaching event. I was coaching on the sidelines of a football game, and my back gave out. And I, it, it was close enough to where uh, an ambulance was was could talked about, but I was too prideful. I did not want to be carried off the sideline as a coach. <laughs> right. And um, so that was, that was when I was introduced to 
Psalm 32, and that was when the the psalm of uh, repentance and forgiveness. And in Psalm 32, David writes, he says, When I was silent, my bones wasted away. But when I forgave and asked forgiveness for my sins and and repented, I was washed as whiter than snow. And so I began to think about that because my bones were wasting away. It was a, a, my back had literally given out and a slip disc and that was causing all kinds of trauma and problem. And um, so in that process of getting diagnosed with what that was, he also realized that I had a heart uh, calcification. And so it was not just one big problem, but two. And so that, that Psalm 32 came into uh, play, and I realized that maybe there was hidden sin in my life that I had not yet dealt with. And I didn't know what that was because it wasn't obvious. It wasn't like I was uh, an addict of anything. After, especially after the discipline of walking so much and praying so prayerfully and uh, having already started out with a, with a head start on faithfulness to get, begin with, what was that? And so I realized that maybe in some areas of my life, in this case it was purity, I had not mastered sin as God challenges us in Genesis 4-7. Sin lurks at our door. It crouches waiting to get in, and we must master it. And I had not mastered that. And so that was life-changing. When I became uh, aware of that, my back eventually healed, my heart healed, and uh, avoided uh, surgery and just have had nothing but I'm on fire right now for the Lord in a bigger way than ever before. (laughs) <laughs> well, folks, I told you you were going to get encouraged. I told you you were going to be challenged and uh, learn uh, from this this man of God. So thank you, guys. So let, let's transition. Let's talk. Let's talk business. Tell us a little bit about uh, Eastway Custom Homes. Uh, what you do, how long you've been in this industry, and uh, we'll get to the the ministry side of that. But just help us understand your company. Yeah, my great grandfather was a home builder up in the Chicago and northern. Uh, Indiana region, and uh, I never met him, but I did meet some of his clients. And my father was a dean, and my mother's father was a engineer. And so here I had a builder, an engineer, and a teacher, really, in my family legacy. And so it was, it was. I loved building from the get go. I just loved being able to look at buildings going up. I love the smell of lumber, and I. I thought that is something I could do. Most of my family members are PhDs or doctors, vets, what have you. And I was the black sheep of the family. And I thought, well, I'm the one that's going to want to use my hands. And so I really grew up uh, early part as a carpenter and um, loved building. And that love took me from, from that avocation to a college degree and I was able to actually get two college degrees, one in, in architecture and the other one in, in construction management. The, I ended up with a company that was my dream company. And it was locally located here in town, Indianapolis, and Hunt Corporation. They built sports stadiums. And I, I was somewhat of an athlete wannabe. And so being able to build these massive sports stadiums, and plus I was a history fan too. So looking back at the Roman Coliseum and the Pantheon and looking at some of the, these big open stadiums and buildings that would allow for sports performances, especially those covered, was a fascination to me. And so being involved with a company that was my favorite one, the number one country to, company to be with in the country for my, my profession was uh, who employed me. And I will say that one of the things that I, I may not have been the best candidate for a job, but my father said, well, if you want something bad enough, just pretend that you are there. And so I, he said, don't send your resume in, don't mail it, don't call, you go to work. And I said, well, dad, I don't have a job yet. They don't know me from Adam. And so I showed up for work, um, all dressed and ready to go. Uh, my first day, walked into the... <laughs> to the, uh, the reception office, and I, I let the receptionist know I'm here to work. And that was kind of a funny thing. That actually led to a good relationship with that receptionist, which actually led to a few interviews right on the spot. This took over six days of doing. I showed up to work. I think my sixth day, I finally was hired. <laughs> and, uh, 
I was not going to say no, and I knew that it was easier for people to say no over the phone or no over the internet than it is to say no to the face. So uh, I needed this job. It was my my top company I wanted to be with. So that's how I got my first job. I then realized after being on some very high profile projects after that, they were the number one sports stadium builder in the world. But I realized that there was so much dysfunction with the employees only because there was very little grounding of family. So the, one family would, uh, one manager or superintendent would travel every two to three years. And so there was never, the roots never took place at any one t- town. And that actually had some very severe adverse effects on the family structure. And I noticed that fairly early on. I said, well, I'm trying to avoid that. My great grandfather on my other side, he distilled back up in the hills of Indiana and was, uh, he spent a lot of time in jail. And he was not a very good father figure to my father. And I want to avoid that. I heard too many stories about that. Plus, it wasn't natural and it wasn't fun to think about. So I thought, I have a better plan for my family. So that was when we decided moving every two years was not healthy for our potential family. My wife's grandmother got sick. It ended up we were forced to come back to Indianapolis after traveling for eight years. And uh, then that's when we actually started our construction business here in town. And that was in late 80s and uh, been in business ever since. And so uh, you've been as a business owner since the 80s. So you've obviously seen ups and downs and, you know, good economies, challenging economies and so forth. So as you look back over your career, What's the hardest thing you've been through as a business owner, and uh, how did your faith help you through that? Mm. Well, that's a that's a big question. I want to say that there have been three times where I was a day away from bankruptcy, and somehow, I mean, even the check in the mailbox type of story. I mean, I I I have one of those stories where the check was in the mailbox, and that provided enough enough to get by. And uh, then that led us to the next project, the next deposit, and uh, next payment. So, gosh, building is not the easiest business and profession. It's fun, but it's not, there's, it's very few barriers to entry. Anyone could be a builder. Anyone could be, so I work a lot with a, a a wide variety of people from all walks of life. And uh, many of them, I have been told, and I, I wouldn't really necessarily agree with this, but I've been told that the average education of a, of a subcontractor would be eighth grade education. Whether that's true, true or not, I completely look past that because I look at the individual now, the person as a person who has been given a gift and that is needed as part of the whole. So they are one part of one body, and we're going to put that gift to use. And so what, no matter what their education level is, it doesn't matter to me as long as they're proficient in what they do. So you, you've talked about then three times in, in that course of business ownership being right at the point of brink of bankruptcy. What role did your faith play in helping you get through those incidences? Hmm. Boy, when you bank and put all of your, your effort into a business and it seems like out of left field um, you've got you've got a savior that's came come about and and I will I will say that I'm not the best at well for example I will tell you that when I hit my thumb with a hammer there are some people who say praise Jesus and there are others who might say <laughs> some other things and uh, I, I am, I'm the latter one. I, would, I wish that I could hit my thumb and say, praise Jesus. And likewise, I wish when I was going through trials that it would be the first inclination to say, Lord, help me through this. But usually there is a short little hiccup and the Lord um, uh, needs to, I'm going through a phase of, of, I could do this on my own, but no, the Lord really gets away in me and think, okay, I can't do this without you, Lord. So I, I think it's always a faith-building exercise for me. On an ongoing basis. I, I, yeah. I appreciate that. And I, 
I pray we don't stub toes while we're on, on the air or anything here. So, folks, we are speaking with Guy East. Guy is the CEO at Eastway Custom Homes, and you can learn more about Guy and his company at eastwaycustomhomes.com. Check them out on the web at eastwaycustomhomes.com. So, Guy, I know that your business is really... Not only are you passionate about the work itself, but you're really you you believe that God has called you into this, and so there's some unique aspects of your company, some unique aspects of how you do what you do. Why don't you take a couple of moments here and, and help us understand that calling, and what are some of those unique aspects of how you go about it? Even some of the training you do and how the, the approach to home building that is really unique with you. Right. So we have, uh, thank you for that question, because we, I definitely feel this is a calling and I have not heard about this anywhere. And so it is really a privilege to be able to, to share that with, with the listeners today. So the, uh, what we have created through really the, the grace of God is what we call the Discipleship Builder Program. And so a discipleship program, as we know, is one that allows us to get to know Christ. And, and if you're discipling someone else's, you get to know Christ with them and getting closer to Christ. Well, what we've seen in the building business is a complete uh, neutralization of what I believe was an original intent of homes and uh, houses to begin with from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. So we know that the four things that a home gives really are safety and protection health, family identity, and an economic boost. So those four things are what we know now. And if you have any trouble understanding what that might be, think of someone who is homeless. Think about their health. Well, are they in a healthy environment under that bridge overpass? Probably not. Think about their protection and safety. If I was a homeless woman, wow, that would be tough on the streets. We think about family identity. There is no place as a homeless person to take your kids or your wife home to. And then you look at the economic boost, uh, a homeless person might be very more for, most focused on that next meal than they are about having a roof over the head at that time. So, but there is a fifth element that has been forgotten, and that's the spiritual element. And throughout the course of the Bible, we are told that that home is to be used for teaching about God. It is an analogy that is used, God uses this as a, a home as a, as a as heaven or as Jesus, come home to Jesus. Uh, even Jesus himself talks about his father having a house that's waiting and Jesus preparing a place for us. We look at uh, Paul in the, in the book of Acts, the last sentence or two of Acts is Paul who's rented a house and he's allowing anyone to come into his home to hear the word of God. And so the word of God just is not used has been watered down too much. Home building has become really more about building towers of Babel than it has been a place to meet those five basic needs as God intended. And so what we're doing with the Discipleship Builder Program is actually bringing an awareness back to that. So we have a, a, a training program that lasts about three months. It involves actually building your real home we train builders and we train customers through this discipleship building program. So whether you're at, at the builder and a professional or whether you're having a home built for you, mm -hmm. uh, either one, you'll be able to, to take a, a step back in time and be able to, to bring back the reverence of what building was intended to be, really. Uh, that I wish I would have started this earlier in my life. I have realized that uh, also in the book of Acts, there's a story about Artemis, and Artemis was a craftsman, and um, he was in a Greek town, and when Paul came in to do his ministry, Artemis, who was a great craftsman of man-made idols and objects, he was very offended because that's how he made his living. And uh, Paul came and, and ruffled the feathers a little bit. I believe that there are a lot of builders out there, like myself, that have spent their lives, as Artemis has done, building man-made idols or man-made objects like nice custom homes without any reverence to Christ at all. So, so you're we're about gonna, to change that. So you're, you've actually, you know, obviously we don't have time on the program to get into it, but you're talking about you've developed training for that, certification for that, that these builders and customers 
can be formally trained and understand that process and how that can be the outcome. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. There's daily devotionals all the way through a 210-day build process. Uh, everything is usually based on uh, the number seven. So we have the seven C's of construction. We have actually seven weeks, seven months of building. It includes very, very little things like if, when you start a project, you put a temporary power pole out on your project and you put a meter right there that feeds that. Well, our temporary power poles are shaped in the shape of a cross. And uh, as we know from the Israelites who were wandering the desert, they actually had a standard and a banner, a flag, a family flag, which is basically our family crest, that goes at the top as well. And so there are, there are very many things like that that we go through. We have home dedications. We have groundbreaking ceremonies. Uh, definitely Sabbath day is respected. So, so I'm just going to put a plug in, if I may. You didn't ask me to do that, right? So if you are listening to the program and you think, wow, this sounds really interesting, I'd like to have perhaps a different experience as in building a home. Maybe you're in the market. Uh, I think they should check out your site, right? They should go Absolutely. to eastwaycustomhomes.com. Maybe they're a builder saying that listening to our program saying, wow, what an amazing thought that could be to actually have a building process based on scripture, based on God's intent around home and these five purposes of a home. That's You're really trying to disrupt and transform an industry, aren't you? Yeah, I'm really wanting to do the right thing, what God has called us to do and me to do. And so I, the intention is not to disrupt it, but it, it is naturally happening. Well, <laughs> I love it. Well, folks, check out uh, Guy East at eastwaycustomhomes.com and uh, learn a different approach, a, a godly approach to leveraging a business for kingdom's sake and building a business uh, and building a home on a kingdom model. And so uh, just two questions now. I want you to advise the 20-year-old Guy East. As you look back, and what would you say sitting across the table from the 20-year-old you, what advice on life or business, faith, what would you have for the 20-year-old Guy East? Mm. Well, I'd have to think. I didn't know the answer to that right off the bat, but the hum humility comes right to the top. I think we've got to humble ourselves. I was not a very humble 20-year-old, very prideful. I thought I could do everything, but when we understand that the power of Christ and the, of the Holy Spirit is much greater than anything we can do, if we get on board with that and understand the power of the Holy Spirit, boy, I wish I could go back to when I was 20. I wish I didn't wait till I was in my 50s to understand that. So I would be, I would be humble and I would stay attuned to what Christ and what God is telling you, because he is speaking to you. It's just, uh, it's oftentimes it's like listening to a radio with uh, just flip it over one one flip and you'll get static. And we live our lives in too much static to not hear God. And so you need to dial it in to what God is telling you. And if I would have done that when I was 20, boy, who knows what I uh, could have accomplished. But I'm, I'm back on an 828, Romans 828 right there, is that God will use all that for the good anyway in His glory. And that's fantastic. So the last question now is going to be about looking forward. And those of you who are regular listeners here at Bottom Line Faith, this is kind of our trademark question. It's called our 423 question, based out of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, where Solomon writes, Above all else, guard your heart, for from it flows all of life. So Guy... Uh, let's end our conversation today on this question. You have a chance. Let's just fast forward. You're at the end of this side of eternity, and you have a chance to sit down with your family, your friends, your loved ones, those who are most precious to you, and you get to pass along your one piece of advice. So fill in the blank. Above all else... Mm. I would say listen to the Lord, or listen to those who listen to the Lord. Those come to mind... But since this is a business program, I would also add in there, you've got a lot of business listeners, I would say probably even something more impactful, but on par with listening, is a practice. And that is something I've practiced, and that is no Bible, no business. So don't go into the office ever without being in the Bible first. Well, I love that. So also then if you know your Bible, you're going to know your business. Yes. Right? Yeah. So with no Bible, there'll be no business. But know your Bible, and then you'll know your business. That's right. Yes, that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Well, folks, I hope you can have a better understanding now of why I opened the program the way I did, because this man, Guy East, is just a godly man who's walking with the Lord, 
and is encouraging and training and equipping many others to walk with the Lord. He's a disciple maker, and he's an encourager, and now you're learning how he's also uh, disrupting and transforming an entire industry. At least that's the vision God's put on his heart, but also the model. Guy, thank you for joining us here at Bottom Line Faith. I I hope that you've been encouraged and blessed. I know I have, and I'm sure our listeners have, but just thanks for being here today. Well, thank you for having me, Ray. Well, folks, that wraps up another edition of Bottom Line Faith, and uh, uh, this has just been so encouraging for me. And uh, again, check out our website at bottomlinefaith.org. Become a subscriber, pass it along to your friends, let them know this is the place where we learn from top Christian business leaders on how they're living out the faith in the marketplace. Until next time, I am your host, Ray Hilbert, asking you to consider how God would use you in the marketplace for His glory. God bless, and we'll see you soon. Bottom Line Faith is brought to you by Truth at Work. If you'd like to hear about new episodes or listen to past episodes, visit us online at bottomlinefaith.org. You can also subscribe to the show through Google Play and iTunes. 